Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I'm Judy Howard with ARC Operations, and here is the guest speaker for today's topic, Hot Topics and Trends uh, in Payments, uh, just back from ARC's payment forum in Tampa, Florida, uh, June 11th and 12th this year, uh, with airlines and agencies uh, attending the forum this year. I have Jennifer Watkins, who's the Director of Payments here at ARC. She's been with us for over 20 years, has been pretty much in the credit card Space and has also held um, with other companies and industries some uh, different positions, but it's all really been in credit cards. She's really well versed, well informed, uh, so I can't wait to turn it over to Jen. But before I do that, for those of you who have attended our webinars before, you just go, or who haven't, just go to the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. There is an area that says questions. Uh, I encourage you throughout Jennifer's presentation this afternoon to type those in and we're going to try to um, intermittently as she goes through the next hour get to as many of those questions as possible. The ones we don't get to, um, I'll get with Jennifer to follow up on those specific questions we don't get around to or ones that are more um, specific to an individual that's asked them. So without further ado, everyone will be muted through the, co the call this afternoon, so write those questions in. But without further ado, again, like I said, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. Jennifer, welcome this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. I am happy to be here to talk to you about um, hot topics and trends in payments and sort of what happened at the ARC Payments Forum this year. Um, going to the next slide. <laughs> so we're going to do start out with an overview of the ARC Payments Forum and what it is, um, and then we'll dig into what we actually talked about this year. Um, number one was NDC and One Order. Most of you have probably heard a little bit about this, and I am not going to talk about it a lot. I'm just going to sort of talk a little bit about it and how it may or will impact payments in the end. We'll talk about credentials on file, and I'm sure some of you are going, oh my gosh, what is that and why do I care? <laughs> I'm hoping uh, by the end of this, you'll understand what it is and why you, you might care. Then we'll talk about 3D Secure 2.0. 3D Secure is the online uh, fraud prevention tool that is available to agents who, well, any merchant who sells travel or any product online to validate the identity of the cardholder. And then we'll talk a little bit about MasterCard and what they talked about related to ancillary charges and how they're supporting ancillaries. And some, I'll give you a high level overview of their dispute resolution initiative. My hope is that we're gonna get them to come in here and talk to us about that at some point in detail, but I'll give you a little overview. And then the bulk of it honestly is, is the ARC update. So um, we did an update that includes um, everything from some statistics, sort of what's happening at ARC, um, what we see the trends are, um, sort of what, to, what our thoughts are for the future, things like that, and then I'll summarize at the end. So, starting with an overview of the ARC Payments Forum. You know, I guess I struggled a little bit as I was putting this together because I'm like, are there going to be uh, people on this call that were on the call last year or is this a new set of people and if we were standing in a room I could ask you all to, to raise your hands and tell us but unfortunately we're not so I'm going to do just a brief overview of what ARC's payment processing is and how it works uh, this will give you a, sort of a introduction to who all the players are in that process and then it will also give you some additional context as I talk further about sort of what's going on in payments and what the the roles are and responsibilities and uh, of all the different players in the industry. And then I'll jump into the ARC Payments Forum and who the participants are in that, give you some background on how it started and then uh, around what the goals are of that, the ARC Payments Forum. So this is the authorization process. So you can see here we've got the customer, we've got agent, no TA, GDS, the card brands, and then issuers. And so issuers are typically banks that issue us credit cards. So for example, um, I have a Chase Visa card. And you know, American Airlines, for example, has a uh, Barclay issued MasterCard. Um, I think United's is a Chase um, United Airlines uh, Visa card. 
And so those are issuers, Chase and Bank of America, and we all see the commercials on um, TV, particularly when the sports are on for Capital One, who's a big card issuer. Uh, uh, Capital One was in the news yesterday. I won't get into that <laughs> too much, but um, they are a big issuer of credit cards. And so the authorization process works where the customer is coming to your website or you're in your GDS and you are ticketing a transaction and the GDS then has links to all the card brands directly to obtain authorizations for those transactions. And they actually, through the card brand, link up directly with the issuer of that card who responds um, either with a decline or an approval. It comes back through the GDS to you and then you will ticket the transaction. Um, next is the Settlement flow. This is how credit card transactions are settled. And I, I get a lot of questions from agents who just don't quite have a clear picture of how this process works. So I'm going to walk through it real, real quickly here. So again, agent um, in the GDS, each day throughout the day, ARC's receiving data from the GDSs. And at 6 o'clock every morning, we kick off a process to generate uh, what we call credit card billing files, payment card billing files that we output at noon each day to the various acquirers and processors on behalf of the airlines. So where I, you see the acquirer processor here, that is basically a bank that is working on behalf of the airline. Or it could be a processor of a bank that's working on behalf of an airline. Um, you can see in the middle there where I have one arrow pointing directly to the card brand. In the case of American Express, ARCs outputting transactions on behalf of airlines, most of the time they're going directly to American Express. So there isn't a bank in there. They go directly to American Express who then builds their cardholders. There is, they are the acquirer and the issuer. Discover is, uh, at the moment anyway, the same way, where we output transactions directly to Discover and then they build the customers. So they are the issuer and the acquirer. And then the acquirer processes, or I'm sorry, pays the airline for those transactions. So that's how the process works for the transactions that are settled through ARC. So for the ARC payments form, these are the entities that um, have participated over the years. This year, we had more travel agencies than ever. It was actually the only, sec only the second year that travel agents have been included. Um, it used to be very much um, airline focused and um, as I'll talk about in a, in a minute, the goal of this group is to sort of get all the entities in the, the process together to work out and come up with solutions for industry problems. And we realized that travel agents play a big part in that and have a role in it and have some responsibility. and and are gonna be required to make changes as their business needs um, evolve. And so that's why we wanted to include, include travel agents, which is why um, I'm doing this for you as well. So who should participate? Um, the participants are typically payment experts. So more and more we are seeing agencies who have someone on the team who is a payments expert who's looking at what the payment experience is for the cardholder, um, how to manage fraud in, in the payment world, how to manage chargebacks, reconciling payments, um, all of these things are, would be part of a payment expert within an agency or an airline. And so the participants in the ARC payments form are typically individuals within an agency or airline who are um, experts in payments. So the goal of the group, I'm just going to read this real, real quickly. The goal of the ARC Payments Forum is to bring all of the participants in the transaction flow together to ensure that we are supporting payments, payment processing in a way that provides the best customer experience, improves risk management, and therefore prevents loss, and ensures the lowest cost processing of payments. And so um, we want everyone to understand the goals, challenges, and impacts to all the parties. We identify solutions to the challenges we have, and we bring those solutions to life. So I go to a lot of conferences, payment conferences, even, even travel payment conferences, and they're very much sort of um, 
you know, what's the customer experience going to be like in five years and, you know, very sort of strategic and focus and trying to just take a look at trends and things like that. And the art payment forum is kind of focused on taking all of that and actually bringing it to life. Because if you want to do something like 3D Secure, everyone in the transaction process is going to have to make changes to support that initiative. So um, it actually s sort of started <laughs> several years ago. I think this was our fifth year of the payment plan. And the first time we did it, it was because we had received calls from agents, or I'm sorry, from airlines that transactions were rejecting when they got to the credit card company. And so they weren't getting paid. And so these transactions were being initiated through travel agents coming to us and we're outputting them to the processors and they were, could not be processed because there was data that was required by the card brands that wasn't included on the transaction. And um, in the end, in that scenario anyway, the card brand that had this new data requirement that wasn't communicated throughout the industry changed the requirement so that the transactions could process. And so in that case, the the solution was a as an was an advocacy one in that we advocated on behalf of the industry, got everyone together in front of this card brand and said, hey, we we are unable to support your new data requirements. If you want your card accepted, <laughs> you're going to have to change your requirements. And but then with the commitment that we as an industry would work together more closely to ensure that whatever they're trying to do, um, will work as an industry to try to meet those needs. So um, the goal to support payment acceptance and processing in a way that provides the best customer experience. This is a big, big focus right now. It's a huge in whether it's you're talking to Amazon or Walmart or an airline, providing a, the best customer payment experience is is important to them. And you know, there's a couple of players out there that do this really, really well. Um, to the point where you don't even think about the payment. And to me, the best example is up, um, Uber, where you put your payment in, now you call your Uber, they come pick you up, they drop you off, you've paid and you don't even know it. So that's kind of what the airlines are looking to do as well, and really any merchant. Amazon's very similar. Payment is so easy in Amazon, sometimes I'm worried I'm gonna hit payment and I didn't even mean to. <laughs> I think that, that's probably, they're probably on that edge of, you know, is there a concern the customer could hit payment for something they don't actually want? Uh, but they, they do a great job. Um, air, airlines are always looking for new ways to pay as well. And so making sure that the options they want to make available are supported. And then looking ahead to what the future might be. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Improving risk management and preventing loss clearly a big focus and I've got some stats around sort of what the ch trends are around chargebacks uh, later in the presentation, but the focus has really been on trying to bring fraud prevention tools to life. And, and right now, the, the best one, the one that's actually going to shift liability in, in situations where it's in use is 3D Secure. And so Visa and MasterCard have and American Express all have their own way of um, marketing this. Visa calls it verified by Visa. MasterCard um, changed the name. It used to be called, called Secure Code and now it's called Identity Check. And so 3D Secure and everyone in the process has um, changes that are gonna have to be made to support 3D Secure. And I'll talk more about that. Ensuring the lowest cost processing of payments. I, you know, I don't know that agents, typical agents understand sort of what the cost of payment acceptance is. Um, larger agents, obviously, if you have your own merchant account, you're going to be sensitive to this as well. But the average, and this is very, very conservative, the average cost to process a credit card transaction, um, or I should say a payment card transaction, I'll only even throw debit in there, is about 2% of the amount of the transaction. And so you can understand why airlines in particular are sensitive to it, because last year, ARC processed um, approximately $90 billion in transactions, 
and that the, the expense then to them for card acceptance was $1.6 billion. So managing payment acceptance expense is a huge priority for them because it's a huge expense for them. And so that makes it a priority for us as well. <coughs> um, the, another part of reducing uh, the cost of payment is reducing chargebacks and making sure that we are doing what we can to keep fraud out of the system. And then finally, one of our goals is to advocate on behalf of the industry with the card brands in particular, um, just to, to make sure that as the card brands are making changes, they understand what the potential impact could be to our industry and work with us to come up with something that's um, reasonable and that we can actually support. So the, the actual payments forum this year, and so we started, it was like, like Judy said, it was June 11 and 12. It was in Tampa this year. ARC has an office in Tampa, so we try to do it sort of where we have an office. This is the first time we've done it not in the DC area. So we did it in Tampa, and it, it started with an NDC in one order discussion because we knew that each of the card brands was gonna also wanna touch on um, NDC in one order and what the potential impact is going to be for the future as as that changes or as, as it evolves and it, it grows. And so um, I just, just to sort of highlight, this is sort of what the distribution looks like today. So you've got airlines that go direct to travelers. You've got agents who have direct connections who are using you know, either an API that was developed by the airline or something that was ag mutually agreed upon between the agent and the airline, something that's not standard. Um, and then you've got the typical GDS where the availability is coming to the GDS who's then making the offering to the agency, or you have third parties like ATPCO and OAG who are providing fair information through the GDS to the agents. So that's kind of how it works today. But in the future, with NDC, let me just finish this one point, um, it's going to be streamlined. So yes, of course, airlines will always have their direct relationship with the customers, um, but NDC is gonna create a standard where agents and airlines can work together directly um, or through a content aggregator like a GDS or other technology provider using that NDC standard. So NDC is just a schema that is the standard for sharing information back and forth. Great, Jennifer, because a question just did come in okay. um, in regards to what is NDC, okay. um, which is new distribution capability. Correct. And I think you kind of um, reviewed that it is really just a standard schema. Yeah. Like, is there anything else that you can expand upon that yeah. that would um, be yeah. helpful? Yeah, I mean, so NDC is just a schema. So it's an XML schema that um, IATA has been developing along with the airlines and agents and ARC's been a big participant in sort of identifying or defining the standard and it's constantly evolving and so it was really they started sort of with the ticketing process and what that would look like with it from a between the agent and airline and what that schema looks like but it's developed to help um, airlines distribute their products through agents um, in a more robust way and offering, getting information about the customer so that they can pinpoint the offering. Um, it's designed to help sort of retail to the customer. And I, I think maybe the next part of my discussion, which is around one order, will sort of outline how the NDC schema can then be used um, for what the vision is in the future, which is around one order. Um, Great, thank you, Jen. So, this is how an order looks today. And so you, you know, a customer comes, they buy a flight and they get charged $500 and they pay for that. Um, and then they get a seat and they pay $30, $130 for that or whatever it would be. Um, and they get a separate charge for that. And Wi-Fi is a separate charge. And they're all separate within, the, within your systems, within the airline systems, within the GDS, they're all separate transactions. And so the goal of one order, and I guess for me, in just my experience in travel, traveling as a traveler, is that the PNR from the agency is different from the airline PNR. 
And so it's like, why? So now I don't even have the, like if I want to change my seat and I want to go directly to the airline, I can't even do that um, because I don't know what the airline PNR is because I just got my PNR from the agency. And so the goal is to tie all of that together so that it's all the same information that's being shared with the customer, that you have a full picture of what that customer journey is all in one, in one order, <laughs> which is where obviously the name came from. So um, in this case, you would have an airline ticket, extra leg room, the cost would be you know, a com com combination of those two. They might pay for each of these separately, which is where sort of the payment discussion comes in because um, one order is is evolving, and the payment card brands in particular, and, and me as well, are concerned that we need to make sure that the payment process is meeting the industry needs, particularly in a corporate environment <clears throat> where corporations want to know, based on what their customers are billed for expense reporting purposes, reconciliation, they want to know what is in that transaction and they want some detail behind it. So. We need to make sure that as we're doing one order and developing this new um, way of billing customers and managing a traveler, that we're supporting payment in a way that meets the industry needs. Jennifer, um, a question came in regarding um, one order. Is it possible um, in this sort of shopping cart sort of idea, right, mm -hmm. um, that different credit cards could be used for yeah. different items that are potentially being purchased, like the airline ticket could be on one credit mm -hmm. card, some of the seat and meal potentially mm -hmm. on another credit card, I don't know, a blanket on something else. Right, Is right. that possible? It's possible, and I'll, I'll tell you, I, because I've been involved in the IATA um, payments um, NDC meetings, that it's evolving, but supporting multiple forms of payment for each piece or even within a piece so if, if you want to if you want to do buy an airline ticket and you want to use two forms of payment, you will be able to. If you want to, you know, buy an airline ticket and a seat and use one form of payment, you'll be able to. So the schema will be developed so that it'll support um, that level of flexibility. Okay. So just to be clear, if it's one ticket, one person traveling, mm -hmm. one price for the ticket, potentially multiple forms of payment could be used Correct. to pay for that one Correct. ticket. Yes. Oh. Yep. Okay. Um, today, the way ARC does it, or it's done it for those of you who do multiple forms of payment transactions, it's pretty kludgy. And so, and ARC is actually in, got a project underway to fix that because um, we know it's an issue. But in an NDC environment, I think everyone's aware that multiple forms of payment is really important. I mean, I went to Target the other day, and I think I used four gift cards. You know, I mean, you should be able to do that, right? right. So, and do it easily. And, and in our industry, we haven't made that easy, so we need to do a better job. And so it's definitely sort of on the um, it's on the list of priorities to make sure that happens in every in one word. And Jennifer, and all the conferences and what you know today, and we've had separate webinars on one order as well. How far in the future is that with these multiple forms of payment uh, potentially? Is it next year? Is it a couple of years? I mean, I guess I foresee. Uh, you know, I'm not an NDC expert, so I don't know um, sort of where we are in adoption. I mean, I, we, I know we're working with uh, probably 10 airlines right now on an NDC implementation. So NDC will come. New, one order will be next. And so uh, there are going to be, I would say, pretty significant system changes required across the entire ecosystem, including ARC and the airlines and the GDSs. And I mean, it's it's an entirely different way of driving a ticket. And so I foresee that being some 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 way down the road. <laughs> yeah, because it impact, there's so many um, yeah. different impacts and variables. Right. And everyone has, if you know, if an agency is going to do a one order transaction through an airline, they're going to have to be able to support it. And that airline is and, the, and whoever the provider is and everyone in the chain has got to be able to support it. So, um, you know, I think it's going to be a little bit longer before we see one order, but NDC is, is here. And, and a question did come in um, in regards to all this. It said, are those payments by one order processed through ARC, IAR, altogether or separately by type or service? Do we know that yet? Do we yeah. know what that's going to 
look like? Well, we don't know exactly, and I think it's going to depend on the airline. So each airline is taking a look at their distribution strategy, and they're trying to make decisions about what, how they want to support the industry or what, how they want to distribute their product. And so it really remains to be seen what each individual, individual airline wants to do. Right. Yeah. Um, and if agents have questions moving forward, are would I mean we've got so, able I would to help that, guide them yeah. through this or have answers to how? Yeah, I think we have a few webinars out there already of specifically about NDC and one order. And yeah. so I would recommend that that agents who are interested in getting more information would go look at those. Yeah, and as um, things evolve. Absolutely, Jennifer, we have had one order and NDC, and we'll continue to have those sessions as our, um can keep everyone and all of our agent community mm -hmm. updated. Yep. So um, It's always a hot topic at Travel Connect, at ARC's Travel Connect conference. NDC is always a big topic. So, um, yeah, as far as payment, it's evolving still. So the NDC schema, like I said, was developed with a focus on ticketing and the back and forth on ticketing. and. Unfortunately, payment wasn't thought of sort of right up front, mm -hmm. and so we are doing pretty heads down work on uh, the schema right now to support payments and what that's going to look like in the future. Yeah, and Jennifer, I know you'll be back with us when there's more information to yeah. share, as will others um, in our organization within ARC that um, really their main focus of their job is NDC yeah. at this time. So yeah. we will keep everyone informed, and uh, there is information on our website as well. We do have also some recorded webinars. Another question came in, and then I'll let you get moving forward, because okay. <laughs> I know you have a lot to, to talk about. Um, the question is, will our gift cards ever be offered? Is that ever been gift considered? Um, gift cards <laughs> considered. I mean, we consider everything around payments. Um, Gift cards, I mean, God, I could do a webinar probably on gift cards and sort of the challenges in our industry around gift cards. ARC, I'm not seeing ARC, at least not on the horizon, um, getting into issuing gift cards. Um, you know, you can go to Walgreens and get a Southwest gift card or an American Airlines or Delta gift card. So that exists. Um, gift cards are challenging because, and this is me putting my fraud hat on, we see a lot of fraud around gift cards. And so I think it, it is challenging to sort of manage that in that environment. Okay, and one other quick question before yeah. we get off the yeah. gift cards. Um, can gift cards, besides the airline dedicated ones, like a you know a Visa mm -hmm. or Amex gift card, mm -hmm. can someone buy an airline ticket today with a gift card? They can, yep, because it's gonna, if it's a Visa or MasterCard gift card, that's an accepted form of payment for for almost all the airlines. And so, yes, a gift card can be used for an airline ticket sale, assuming that airline accepts that card brand. So believe it or not, we still have like some really small um, airlines that are not US focused that don't accept credit cards. You wouldn't be able to use it on that airline. You could use it, you can use it in TAF for the service fee program, ARC service fee program, or you could use it on an airline direct for assuming that airline accepts that form of payment. Okay, great. And it's nice to know as well, we accept the gift card, the Visa American Express gift cards for TAF, or MasterCard. As we well. do. Yep. Thanks, Jennifer. Good I'll let questions, you, good questions. Yeah, keep them coming, everyone. Um, I'll let you continue. Okay, so I'm gonna move on from one order. Yeah, it's not my area of expertise, so there's a lot, a lot better uh, information and content out there on that. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about credentials on file. And, um, and why you should care about it. <laughs> um, credentials on file, this means anytime you go to a website and you purchase something and they ask you if you want them to keep your, your or you want to create a login, they are storing some credential information about you. And in most cases, at least for you know the, the agency sites I go to or the airline direct sites or Amazon, they are storing my credentials in their system. And so credentials on file is important because it helps the, in an authorization request, and this is where the credential on file conversation goes, is in an auth request, that issuer, Capital One, for example, wants to know from that merchant that that transaction was credentials on file. This is not the first time you've seen this customer. That customer is a re, re Returning customer, they're a recurring biller, and you actually, as the merchant, have a relationship with that customer. And so it's about providing the 
issuer with additional information about um, that transaction. And so here's, here's the authorization process I was talking about before. And so credentials on, in file impacts this first piece where the customer is entering their payment. In a credentials on file situation, when you have their credentials available, you have their card information, they've already done a CVV, which is the, the three character or four character code on the card, they've done, you've done that validation on them, um, that information is stored in your system, not the CVV code, remind you, that should never be stored, but the fact that you did a uh, CVV check previously would be available as well. And so in a credentials on file situation, it goes from where the customer's entering their payments to the customer's just selecting pay. Uh, in an Amazon scenario, for example, um, you hit click pay and you're done because they've got your credentials on file. And so um, one of the challenges we have in our industry is within the GDS, so agents have um, systems that manage their, their customers' credentials. Sometimes that just, they're using the GDS as that, sample, that system to manage the customer's credentials. And so it's, it's going to become increasingly important for us to pass information in the transaction for authorization saying that this is a credential on file transaction. And so um, for agents that do this on a broad scale, I mean, particularly for corporate, that corporate card issuer is going to want to know that that's the, a credential on file that's stored within the agency. And um, so let me talk a little bit about what the difference between when it's entered by the customer and it's a credential on file. When the customer enters it, it's a one-time customer. At that time, you're, most of the time you're requesting a CID, you're doing a, a verification of the unembossed number on the front or back of the card. You're doing address verification. And the issuer, if, if they don't get some type of indication this is a credentials on file, can, may score that a little bit higher because it's the first time that customer's been at your location or on your website. In a, in a credentials on file situation, you know that customer they're returning. You are not required to do CID because you've already done it before. You've already done address verification, so either you have the information available, you can do it again without prompting the customer, or um, you're just telling them I, this is a returning, recurring customer. Um, and it informs the issuer that it's a returning customer. And so the goal is to make sure that the issuers know that the payment credentials were stored so they can make better decisions about approving or declining a transaction. Um, so this is a hot topic across all the card brands, particularly MasterCard. Um, I'm going to move on to 3D Secure 2.0. So if you've been, heard me speak in the last three years, you've probably heard me talk about 3D Secure because it's been um, a huge initiative on our side to get rolled out into the industry because we think it is sort of the future of um, fraud prevention. And so it's, it's really important for us to try to gain adoption in the agency channel. And so 2.0, 1.0, um, came out, oh my gosh, it's been more than 10 years ago, and now we have 2.0. So let me talk about what the differences are. So here you can see in the 1.0 example, it used to be that we would have a password associated with our card. And it might be a word or it might be a code that was associated with our card and it was a static password like we have regular passwords. And so it, what it would do is you would go to the website of the retailer or the airline, they would direct you to your bank, sort of off the, the website, to your bank to do that validation directly with the bank, and then it would come back to the website and the transaction could be completed. And the airlines and really all merchants hated it because it, it took the customer off their site, it was a huge disruption in the transaction flow, and resulted in what we call shopping cart abandonment, where people would say, oh, wait, what is this? I'm being directed. I feel like I'm not comfortable with this. So they would just leave the cart and, and go to a different website. Um, 2.0 is, and a lot of people don't even know they're doing it. So if you've ever received a text message on your phone from your bank, 
for from a retailer saying, please val validate the text message we just, or the number you just received in the text message, that's 2.0, meaning it's a static password. It provides a better customer experience. Um, and that was the goal of 2.0. So here's, here's sort of more detailed. So it challenged, 1.0 challenged every transaction. Um, it, there were only 15 data elements that were, cert, were provided from the merchant to the issuer that gave sort of really basic information about the customer at the point of sale. Like I said, it redirected from the merchant's page to the card issuing bank. It didn't support uh, biometrics or mobile, and it had a high rate of shopping cart abandonment. And, um, but ARC did make changes several years ago to support um, 2.0. I'm sorry, 1.0. And so 2.0 provides 10 times more data. So in, it would, could provide itinerary information. It provides more information about the merchant, the customer, so that the issuer can make a more informed decision about whether or not they want to challenge the cardholder. So challenging the cardholder becomes optional um, by the issuer. And so the issuer will say, yes, I want to challenge this customer. They would send a text to the customer. The customer would then put that text met, that code they received in the text message into the merchant's website and validate that they are who they say they are. Um, it provides a better customer experience because it also uses biometrics and is supported in a mobile environment. So it's less shopping cart abandonment and more security for the merchant. And so one of the challenge, a couple of the challenges we have in our market that we're going to have to work more closely with the card brands on and continue to work on is when there's multiple merchants in a, 3D, a single 3D secure authentication. So the customer's on your website, you're going to charge them for uh, air, car, and hotel and, an, and a service fee. So technically, prior to, or at least in the past, you would have had to do four separate authentications, which is crazy. You cannot require someone to do four separate authentications at the point of sale. So working with the industry, Visa and MasterCard have started to define what this is going to look like so that we can support multiple merchants with a single authentication. Um, and I just want to point out that whatever we do around this is going to require changes by the agency, the GDS, ARC, and the various acquirers and processors. And so we've been working on that. Okay, great. I do have some questions, Jennifer, okay. if I can just take a minute. Mm -hmm. um, this one is, it is kind of a statement question. It is my understanding that IATA is not ready for 3D Secure until the end of the year, and MasterCard has advised system providers to report transactions as MOTO? Moto, mo mo mail, mail order, telephone order. Yes, yes. thank you. Any, and, do, yes. and I guess the question is, do you have any thoughts in regards to this? I do. So... <laughs> Uh, this has this is related. I think the, I'm confident the question is related to um, what's happening in Europe around PSD2 and SCA, which is PSD2 is Payment Services Directive 2, which is a regulation uh, around payments in Europe, and SCA is Strong Cardholder Authentication. So there's a new requirement in Europe that merchants do strong cardholder authentication. And so part of that is um, supporting uh, 3D Secure 2.0, meaning um, you're doing two-factor authentication. So the text situation I just described would meet the burden of proof for strong cardholder authentication. The challenge is that um, IATA's standard, their DISH standard, um, isn't going to be ready to support the SCA requirements, which, hap which happened in October. And so, um, you, the channel, or I, so you can get out of the SCA requirements, or you're not required to do strong cardholder authentication in a mail order, telephone order situation. Um, only when it's done online. Uh, in a face-to-face -face environment, it's with a chip in the card, so they can validate that you actually have the card. So um, I guess the question, it's more of a statement. I mean, yes, that is the case. I think that IATA is working very hard right now to work with the GESs to get that standard updated so that they can be ready as soon as possible. I mean, they wanna they want to be able to comply. It's, it is a 
you know, it's like a lot of regulations. It is a huge lift for the rest of the world <laughs> to do this or all of Europe to do this. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of industries that are probably scrambling to try to to get it in place in time. To meet the deadline. Yeah. Got it. Um, I'm going to just ask one more, and then I'll let you move forward. Um, this statement question. I understand that airlines are trying to make the payment process easy for everyone. However, it seems many airlines still prefer cash payments over credit card types, especially around virtual credit cards. <coughs> What's our position around travelers using virtual credit cards to purchase airline tickets, and why do so many airlines try to avoid, avoid accepting them? Will 3D security Secure work with this type of corporate virtual card. Card. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, that's a so there, 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 there's a lot going on there. Yes, there okay. <laughs> Can you so, help us unravel I that? Can. So airlines love cash, um, and actually, I have a slide later that shows the cash versus the credit volume, and um, they love cash because it's cheaper. I mean, the bottom line is you're, they're paying two percent for a credit card transaction their preference would be to take a cash sale. So last year, ARC processed $10.4 billion in cash. If those had been credit card transactions, it would have cost the airlines $280 million. And that's conservatively. So by accepting cash through ARC and through agencies, the airlines can avoid that $250 million expense that they would have incurred if they had accepted a credit card. Airlines don't like virtual cards because they cost more than 2%. They cost upwards of 3% per, per transaction. And so the airlines really start to get bent out of shape when, when they have a card type that is more expensive than any other card type. And that's sort of where virtual cards come in. Um, in the U.S., virtual cards are not as big of a deal because we are so card heavy today. So we are 90% credit card in ARC because we in the U.S. are used to credit cards. Um, in some other markets, the, it, the market is more cash heavy. And so what, we, what airlines were seeing was rather than agents, rather than paying in cash for a transaction, they were using virtual cards to pay, and that it was did not sit well with the airlines because it's a huge additional expense to them. Our position on virtual cards is it's really between the agent and the airline to determine what is going to be a good form of payment or not, or what that airline is going to accept. ARC is not going to dictate, um, you know, what is a valid form of payment or what's an acceptable form of payment. We're leaving that up to the airline to decide, and. In some cases, it'll be a bilateral agreement between them and the agency. Okay, great. So, yeah. so they could work that out themselves. ARC will um, honor what that is. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. very good. Um, and I lied. There's one more question because okay. I want to make sure we get these in, <laughs> yeah. and I know we time is of the essence here. Um, in the current GDS environment, the CV, the CBB um, is not needed. Will 3D Secure 2.0 change that? So the CBB is never needed. It's never required. Okay. But all of the GDSs support it. So as an agency, it's up to you to decide if you want to do the CBB check. Um, the GDS supports it. If you don't want to do it, you're, you know, it, it's one element in a, in a, in a toolbox of opportunities to reduce your fraud prevention or reduce your fraud to manage the risk of the fraud. So, you know, I encourage agents to use it because it helps them um, monitor for fraud. Um, if they don't, that's up to them. 3D Secure is completely separate from uh, CVB. So, um, and 3D Secure is only available online in a consumer direct facing environment. Um, so, for an agency that doesn't have a website, they're not going to be doing 3D Secure they still would probably want to do a CBB check just to validate that the cardholder has the card. Um, but it's not, it, CBB is not a guarantee of, um, you know, it's not going to shift the liability if there's a fraud chargeback. It is a piece of data that can help you evaluate the risk of the transaction. Okay, great. Thanks, Thanks Jennifer. That's really helpful information. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to move on. Yeah, I'm we have about 15 minutes. Yeah, we have 15 minutes, and then we've got the ARC update part. Okay. Um, so MasterCard, real quick, um, MasterCard made, is making changes to their uh, requirements, or it's not even a requirement. They're making changes to their specifications and their processing of airline tickets to support ancillaries. And they've made it optional by airlines, so each airline can decide if they want to do it or not. ARC currently outputs data about an ancillary that will say it's baggage or um, that it's a 50-pound bag or things like that and what the cost is. Um, so we're out, ARC outputs that data. It's just a matter of now whether or not that airline wants to use that data for processing through MasterCard. Again, it's optional. And, the, and I'll just mention that ARC is updating their dispute resolution um, process. They acquired Ethica earlier this year. Ethica is a uh, fraud prevention provider. Their goal is they're, they've really placed themselves well in the industry as someone who can work with merchants and issuers directly. And so the goal, I think, of that acquisition from MasterCard's perspective was to allow merchants and issuers to work together more directly either at the point of sale, immediately following the point of sale, just trying to identify more quickly and sort of outside of the formal chargeback process um, what the situation is with that transaction. And so MasterCard is trying to sort of head off chargebacks, pre-chargeback. And that's sort of what their, their goals around the, the dispute resolution initiative are. So let me get to the ARC summary. Um, and so what I talked about is I'll give you an overview of the ARC landscape. I'll talk about changes to payments we've made in the last year. Um, I'll give you some payment statistics. I'll talk a little bit about 3D Secure and what we're doing around that. Um, give you some chargeback statistics and a little bit about what the, I think the future looks like. So um, ARC has 237 airlines. Actually, it goes up every month. I think we're up to 240 right now. So I think in the last month since this happened, we've picked up a couple other airlines. Um, we have approximately 12,000 agency locations. Um, we are adding locations. It's been a while, sort of we've seen some con consolidation and the reduction in the number of agency locations, but we added 73 in 2018. <clears throat> uh, in 2018, we settled $95 billion in transactions, which was up 7.1% over 2017. Um, and I guess one thing I think is important to point out that is that 70% of our volume is from three airlines and 20 agencies. So we have seen a massive consolidation uh, in airlines and agencies. I mean, our board, our board is a little bit smaller there now that we don't have U.S. Airways, we don't have Northwest, we don't have, we've just seen a consolidation in the industry. <clears throat> so we, we process approximately 11% cash last year and 89% credit card. PayPal, and I throw this one up there just to throw everyone off, but we actually added PayPal in 2014 as a form of payment. Um, and we've got several airlines that accept it. It's just that the agents haven't built the infrastructure to actually accept it on behalf of those airlines. <clears throat> and so we did that in 2014. I think some airlines are like, oh, we did that how, how many years ago? Yes, 2014, we added PayPal. I think there's probably employees at ARC that don't, don't realize that we accept PayPal as a form of payment, um, but we do. And we've got several airlines that are set up to accept it as well. Alipay. So Alipay is um, a huge card form of payment in China. Um, with the sort of growth in travel of Chinese to the US, we got requests from airlines to add it. And so we, we did. So we've added Alipay as a valid form of payment. <clears throat> the challenge is that we do not currently have any airlines that are set up to accept it. Um, in addition, the heavy lift really for Alipay is at the point of sale. So there's going to have to be an agency who wants to set up to be set up to accept Alipay is going to have to build a little bit of infrastructure on the front end to be able to accept that form of payment. And so if there are agents out there that are interested in pursuing this, please let me know. I would love to talk to you about it and maybe work with you and an airline to, to get it started. 
um, in saying that, Jennifer, can you give your contact information or how would you sure. like people to reach you? So I have, I'm going to put an email address up here at the end. Perfect. Just um, want to make sure people had that if they were interested. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, and then Union Pay. So Union Pay is another big form of payment in China. Um, it's simpler in the U.S. because they've integrated with Discover. So um, for an, from an airline's perspective, it's easier to accept because it goes down the Discover rails, which are pretty ubiquitous. Um, but we still don't have any airlines accepting it either. So if there are agents out there that, that are interested in accepting union pay, I'm happy to work again with you and, and try to work with some airlines to, to set that up. Payment statistics. So this is our sales process in, over the last three years. And this is, I, I wanted to include it just for um, the year, just to show sort of that there's been growth. And so you can see ARC's volume has grown pretty significantly in the last two and a half years. Um, we processed, like I said, $94.8 billion in transactions last year. This is when you look at cash versus credit by percentage. So we've actually seen the percentage be pretty flat. Um, it's up a little bit for the first four months of the year. Um, we can see that can change anytime. But as you can see, it's right around 11% of our transactions are processed on cash and close to 90 in, uh, in credit card, 80, 89% in credit card. So here shows um, by card brand. I thought you all might think this was interesting. So you can see at the top is Visa. And so Visa is up to 40% of the credit card volume. Uh, 30, American Express is behind them with 32%. And MasterCard is below them at 23. At the bottom, you can see UATP is, is holding steady right around 3% and discovers about 1% of our volume. Um, you can see, I guess what I, what I find interesting, and it's pretty clear in this, is that the Amex is trending down and MasterCard is trending up. Um, we looked really, we watched really closely when the Costco card switched from an American Express card to a Visa card, just to see where that shift would happen, at least in travel, particularly uh, like someone like Alaska Airlines in Seattle, who's got a huge, um, you know, Seattle base of customers, along with Costco, who has a huge Seattle base of customers. Um, but what was interesting is we actually saw around the same time a shift from Visa to MasterCard. So it was like, okay, MasterCard or Visa picked up this Costco share, but then MasterCard picked up some other shares. So there was a, some big, a couple of big card issuers that started issuing MasterCard instead of Visa at that same time. So you can see MasterCard's volume is growing. So what, I guess what's interesting, this is when you look at it by, do, by dollar. So this is the amounts of the transactions. When you look at it by count, Visa's volume is even bigger. So they have 45% when you look at it by transaction count. Um, MasterCard is approaching Amex here on when you look at it this way as well, which I think is really interesting. I mean, it was only probably six years ago that, that Visa surpassed Amex um, in either of these, but they've picked up a lot of volume and Amex is kind of... Um, slowly winding down, it looks like. Um, UATP and Discover, again, are near the bottom there. This is the average ticket, which I think is interesting, um, because UATP has the largest average ticket. So they're very corporate focused. So it's obviously um, going to be something that drives the high average ticket amount. Amex is right below them, because they do a lot of corporate as well. And then MasterCard, Visa, and Discover are um, below them sort of in, in sequence there. 3D Secure update. So we talked a little bit about 3D Secure, and, and if you've heard me talk about 3D Secure, you know that ARC made the changes to our, um, our, output, our input and output specifications to be able to support the data elements that are required to support 3D Secure. And that happened in 2016. And um, over the last year, as 2.0 has been rolled out. We've been watching very closely to see if there were going to be any requirements changes that we were going to have to make to support 2.0. And it turns out that the biggest changes in 2.0 are on the authentication side. So between 
the customer and the, or I'm sorry, the merchant and the issuer. And so um, we haven't had been required to make a lot of changes, although MasterCard did announce to us that they are adding a new field to um, the settlement file to support 2.0. So we are in the process of making those changes um, to our output specification, input and output specifications to support in that additional MasterCard field. And I also need to point out that American Express does not currently have a solution, a 3D secure solution for the travel agency distribution channel. So they don't have a solution that supports this th sort of third party card acceptance environment. And so we are um, continuing to try to engage with them to come up with a solution for our industry. So um, it's really, when we talk about 3D secure right now, it's all about Visa and MasterCard. Um, and I'm getting to the end here. Chargebacks, everyone, I know, I always get questions about chargebacks because it's a hot topic. Uh, but you can see the gray line on the left is 2019. So we are seeing chargebacks lower than they've ever been, which is fantastic. And when you look at it, I like this one because it really shows, it gets, puts in perspective a little bit what the actual chargeback um, ratio is in the travel agency distribution channel. And you can see for um, 2018, for example, it was about five basis points, a little more between five and six basis points. From my perspective, that is an incredibly low number. And so it kind of, for me, highlights that the travel agency distribution channel overall is a very, very safe um, environment for accepting card payment. And a lot of it is because the, in the travel agency community, we know our customers or the agencies know their customers. That's a lot of corporate, they know their customers. So, so while I know it's a hot topic and it is really painful when airlines agencies get um, chargebacks, the ratio is really low. One quick question, and I know we only have like three minutes yeah. now, but I just did want to get this in because an agent did ask um, on the webinar this afternoon about chip cards. Uh, they do everything that's required of them, but they mm -hmm. still are getting chargebacks from the airlines. And the question is, is what's ARC doing yeah. about this? Um, so chip cards are only going to be applicable in a card present environment. So where if someone's walking into an agency with a card, like I walk into the grocery store with my card and I put it in the card reader, and then that merchant is protected because I had the card there. Um, a vast, vast, vast majority of the transactions that are processed in the agency channel are card not present, meaning they're not face-to-face. -face. So a chip card's not gonna be applicable in that environment. So for I've had conversations with a few agents out there that do have actual people coming in off the street into their agency, and it is a challenge. From my perspective, those transactions right off the bat are lower risk than any other transaction because the customer is actually walking into your agency with a card. You're seeing them face to face. Most fraudsters are interested in sort of perpetrating fraud um, and not having to look at you eye to eye while they do it. Um, so in order to put the infrastructure in place within a GDS to do a chip card through the GAS and the whole authorization process is very expensive. That's a lot of infrastructure that would have to be put in place to do that. And given that the volume is so low, I'm just not seeing it. My recommendation for agents that are doing that is to contact your GDS. Because ARC is very, very, very happy to support you and support sort of that transaction flow. But we need to hear from the GDSs that they're going to do it and they want us to do it and, and we'll support the industry to do it. We need to hear from the agents that do yeah. it. they want the GDSs to do it. Yeah. yeah, that's good information. And I'm just going to add for the um, person on the line that did ask that, Jennifer will provide her contact information at the end of this. And um, I would suggest reaching out to her if she didn't answer your question um, in regards to maybe what can be done in the future. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. So real quick, future because we've only got like a minute. I put this slide together just sort of as the buzzwords of what we're hearing out in the industry around payments. Um, it's about millennials, it's about Venmo and Zelle and real-time payments and Apple Pay, Google Pay, um, installments, privacy is always a big topic, security. Um, yeah, so this is sort of what's on our mind when it comes to what the future of payments is. 
Um, and so just to summarize, this is these are the topics that we talked about. Um, supporting for ancillaries, NDC in one order, 3D secure, credentials on file, um, all sort of the hot topics of the day right now um, when you get into the details of payments, but it's it's broader. It's, it's around what's going to be the next big form of payment in the U.S. We're so card heavy, but there's got to be something else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, yeah, Jennifer, do you have your, do you have a slide oh, that I'm does sorry. have your information? Um, because um, I think this will be very helpful. Yeah. So the ARC Payments Forum, if you're interested in participating, please send an email to creditcardservices at arccorp.com. My personal email, if you have a question that you would like me to address personally, is jwatkins, W-A-T-K-I-N-S, at arccorp.com. And I'll be happy to uh, get back to you. This is a this is the general credit card services number, which I also or email I also get. So great, yeah. great Jennifer, a plethora of information here this afternoon. It's a lot to take in. There were some questions we didn't get to. I'm going to forward those on to Jennifer um, to reach out directly. But I want to thank all of you for taking the time this afternoon to be with us. Uh, if you have to drop off, please do. But I'm just going to give you a few little um, housekeeping items. On August 22nd, we'll have Delta Airlines with us. And that will be at 2 o'clock Eastern time. You look for that um, invitation to come in your email. We'll also be in the TAC. Um, and that is going to be on audit and debit memo management. So that's a really good one to look for. Also, we had fraud month coming up in September. Um, and um, we hope that you can join our sessions. We'll have about 10 different sessions throughout the month of September. So uh, what Jennifer um, didn't cover in fraud, those sessions may interest you. They'll, they'll um, be, again, a variety of what is going to be offered. And then we hope to see you at our Travel Connect conference October 3rd through 4th. Um, and if you're interested in that, go to our corp.com site slash Travel Connect to register. I, as always, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you do have questions, um, just general, I will be sending you Send me an email, jhoward at arccorp.com, arccorp.com, and I'll send you the presentation. Otherwise, this uh, recorded session will be on our corporate site uh, under training, webinars on demand, where we have all our sessions. Thanks you, thank you again, and hope to see you on our future webinars. Thanks, everyone.